Thanks. So welcome home. Um, my name is Evan Roux. I'm an independent free and open source uh, software developer, mostly focused on GDAL, Map Server, uh, Proj, LibJotif, QGIS, and a few a few other projects. So in this talk, I'm going to to give an overview of the changes uh, GDAL has received uh, during the last year with the uh, 2.4 and 3.0 releases. Uh, so. Just to sum up GDAL in, in one slide. So GDAL stands for Geospatial Data Abstraction Library. And it's a piece of software you use sometimes without even realizing it. Uh, when you want to read or write a geospatial uh, formats in most uh, C or C++ uh, open source or closed source GIS software. So as of today, it handles more than 240 different uh, formats and as a trend of recent years, it also handles uh, more and more network protocols and services. Uh, JDAL uses an uh, MIT X open uh, source license, which is a permissive one, uh, enabling you to use it uh, in all software you, you want. So, over the course of last year, uh, we had two feature oriented JDAL releases, which is a uh, quite unusual because uh, we generally follow roughly uh, yearly annual cycle, but as the integration of Proj 6 uh, turned out to uh, add some uh, backward incompatibilities, we decided to do an, anti an unanticipated uh, GDAL 2.4 releases uh, with uh, good stuff that was already ready. Um, and so even if it was uh, seven months uh, uh, development cycle, it was a fairly busy, busy release with uh, nearly 1,400 uh, 1, commits. Uh, so each new GDAL version uh, comes with uh, new drivers, and uh, 2.4 was not an exception to this. Uh, I will not uh, go into much details about the three uh, items on this slide because those are mostly side products of the Project 6 effort and uh, technical uh, drivers to, to read the uh, datum shift grids. Uh, an in interesting new item is the NGW driver. Uh, NGW stands for Next G Web, and it's a server GIS, uh, which allows you to, to store and edit geodata and uh, display maps in, in web browser. Um, it's licensed uh, under GPL2. And we have also this EEDAA, which stands for Earth Engine Data API Image Driver. And it's a way of accessing uh, rasters which are stored on Google Earth Engine with uh, partial uh, uh, download capabilities of uh, piece of images. Uh, so the Earth Engine API itself was uh, quite a bit experimental when the driver was released. So make sure you use the latest uh, GDAL 2.4.2 release, uh, which has received uh, upgrades for the API changes. Uh, on the vector side, we have uh, the GeoJSON SEC driver. So SEC is uh, for sequence of uh, GeoJSON features, which are separated by a new line or uh, record uh, uh, separator uh, characters. And so this is a cleaner way of having big uh, data sets of GeoJSON instead of having a, a gigabytes uh, GeoJSON feature collection, which used to blow your RAM when you tried to, to open it. So GeoJSON SEC is an appropriate tool for such uh, huge data sets. Uh, I mentioned NGW on the uh, vector side and it has its uh, raster side uh, counterpart too. And uh, the same for EEDA, uh, it's a vector uh, driver which enables you to query uh, which uh, rasters are available on uh, Google Earth Engine and do a special or uh, attribute uh, queries uh, to find the image you're interested. Uh, some drivers, existing drivers, have uh, received uh, updates. So the bag, bag is for uh, bathymetric attributed grid. 
and uh, so the, now the new, new version of the driver can support uh, reading uh, variable resolution grids because bag comes f generally from a lower resolution grid and several chips uh, of different uh, resolution and the driver can do an interpolation of that to present a single resolution uh, uh, grid and write support uh, was also added. Uh, regarding the Jotif driver, uh, it receives two it received support for two new codecs. Uh, LERC uh, stands for Limited Error Raster Compression. It's a lossy compression scheme where you can define the maximum amount of errors in, in terms of pixel values you, you want to tolerate. Um, and the WebP codec uh, is also useful in, in use cases where you would have uh, used a JPEG uh, before. And uh, one of the key features of WEP is that it supports alpha channel. And so uh, this is a quite a promising uh, codec uh, if you want to store uh, uh, big geotiff data in a, in a lossy way. Uh, the PostGIS raster driver um, received support for odd database uh, raster. So those are uh, raster where the imagery is not stored in the database itself but in a, in a file on the, on the file system. And, uh, and the driver has been optimized so that if you run it against a local PostgreSQL instance, it can actually short circuit the uh, uh, database access to directly read uh, the file from the file system. Uh, we also added two new uh, uh, two new uh, virtual file system for the Hadoop file system. So VSI HDF uh, uses a, a lib uh, HDFS library, which is a C library on top of a Java library. And uh, VSI Web HDFS uses a REST API for HDFS. So the last one uh, is uh, built in for standard uh, builds of GDAR. Uh, the JDAL control uh, utility was uh, mostly rewritten from scratch. Uh, it uses a, a marching square algorithm, and it's much faster than the previous one. Uh, and it also received a new mode to generate polygons, uh, whereas previously you could only generate contour lines. And we also had a, a few, uh, I would say, anti-features. Uh, the removal of the PHP and Ruby bindings, uh, which uh, didn't receive any maintenance, so they are gone now. So, if any of you uh, want to bring them back to life, so please, uh, please join and uh, and take uh, take the stick. Uh, this item is mostly uh, of interest for GDAL developers themselves. So, GDAL has a huge uh, regression test suite, which is uh, made of more than uh, two hundred thousand lines of Python. Uh, so by itself, it's bigger than uh, some uh, software project. And it was uh, written in a kind of uh, uh, ad hoc uh, test framework. So it was really unfriendly for uh, newcomers and even for core contributors. It was quite hard to, to write tests. Uh, so Craig the Stichter uh, uh, volunteered to uh, to port the existing uh, test suite to use the PyTest framework. And it was a huge work. He, he used a Bowler Python library, uh, which uh, enabled him to uh, to do most of the way in a uh, semi-automatic uh, way. And he, he gave a, a presentation about how he, he did that at, at PyCon Australia, and I've included here the link to, to his talk. And so this was a really massive effort, and really kudos to, to him and his employer for, for leading this effort. So let's come to GDAL 3.0. Uh, so if you followed the mailing list uh, at the beginning, uh, we considered calling it uh, GDAL 2.5, but as there were uh, some backward incompatibility and Proj 6 was uh, actually a, a new requirement, we decided to, to call it for GDAL 3 to really uh, indicate uh, that there was a, uh, a new step. Um, a few new drivers have been added. Uh, so this, there's this uh, 
DAAS uh, drivers, which is uh, to connect to uh, Airbus uh, satellite imagery. So it's quite similar in its purpose to other similar drivers like the RDA, RDA driver of a digital globe or uh, planet uh, PEL scene or PEL mosaic driver or the Earth engine uh, data API image uh, driver I just mentioned uh, before. Uh, we also have a new uh, driver for TileDB. Um, so it requires uh, GDAL to, to be built uh, against uh, lib TileDB. Uh, open source library and TileDB uh, is a way of uh, managing uh, uh, massive, dense, and sparse uh, multidimensional arrays. Uh, on the vector side, uh, there's a new driver, uh, which is the latest version of uh, the Lim Mongo CXX uh, connector, and uh, this enables you to, to connect to uh, the latest version of the Mong MongoDB database. Uh, we also had a few improvements in existing driver. So the NetCDF driver was extended to, to be able to uh, fetch the, uh, data sets which are organized in uh, hierarchy, hierarchical groups. Um, the PDF driver on the right side uh, was uh, improved uh, to, uh, to be able to uh, generate a PDF file from an XML description file where you configure your uh, layer, uh, layers and uh, uh, which ones are exclusive of uh, each other. And it's, it's going to be used by uh, QGIS uh, 3.10, where the uh, uh, layout uh, manager has been updated to, to use these uh, new capabilities. And for those who are interested in uh, planetary data sets, the last two items, uh, the FITS and PDS4 drivers, have been also updated with, uh, with new capabilities. Uh, okay. uh, so as GDAL uh, gets bigger and bigger over the years, uh, some people have uh, requirements to make it uh, fit in the smaller builds. So we have, uh, for Unix builds, uh, we have a way to uh, disable all optional drivers, and you can manually uh, uh, request the driver you want to build uh, uh, to add in the build, uh, or you can also disable uh, some particular drivers. Uh, there were many Docker images uh, available in the wild uh, for GDAL, um, so we have added a few official ones, uh, if I might say, so there are five uh, different configurations, ranging from very small builds, uh, like, which fit in like uh, 20 megabytes, to a full build uh, based uh, on uh, Ubuntu. Uh, so now let's come to the main driver for the GDAL 3 version, uh, which is the integration of Perch 6. Uh, I'll give this afternoon a dedicated talk uh, on all the work that has happened in, uh, in that area, so um, I'm just going to, to sum it up shortly. So uh, up to now, uh, WKT for CRS uh, used to be in GDAL, and that support has been moved down to Perch 6. And uh, in the meantime, uh, well, it, it, yeah, I, I wrote moved, but yeah, it was essentially rewritten from scratch because uh, we added support for uh, WKT to 2015 and the latest uh, 2019 revision. And uh, the fact that GDAL support them now uh, will enable uh, the wider deployment of WKT2, which qu was quite blocked by uh, uh, GDAL not supporting it. Um, the uh, CRS database, which used to be a collection of CSV files, is now uh, SQLite 3 uh, database, uh, which is handled in Proj. Uh, so this enables to, uh, to have more um, query capabilities and uh, be able to, to handle several CRS catalogs. We also have support from time-dependent coordinate operations um, and the OGR to OGR and GDAL warp uh, utilities have received a new switch, the CT for coordinate transformation, where you can uh, specify a particular approach pipeline. So this is something uh, you, will, you will use uh, typically with a new approach uh, info utility. Uh, so this is clearly for advanced users that want to precisely control the coordinate transformations they want to do on the data. 
And the last item is, yeah, I guess some people will say it's more a bug than a feature. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, on the low-level layers of GDAL, uh, the coordinate transformation API is no EPSG axis order compliant by default. But uh, for the upper layers, we actually uh, added the necess necessary magic to, to not try to break too much uh, existing process. Um, another non non-programming activities, uh, an overall of the website and documentation. Uh, up to now, uh, the documentation used to be uh, a mix of uh, Doxygen files and static HTML pages. Uh, it has quite of uh, non-obvious structures and it was hard to attract contributors to it. So during the Minneapolis Scott Sprint uh, this spring, uh, I, Howard Butler, Matthew Luscott, Dan Baston, and a, a few other people decided to, uh, to change this and, and convert the existing material uh, to restructured text and use the Sphinx uh, framework, which uh, had been used uh, for other friend projects like Proj, Poodle, or uh, Mapser. So a large part of this could be automatically converted, but we had quite a uh, lot of content that had to be manually uh, migrated, so it, it was a pretty busy week. <laughs> uh, so here's how it looks now. So on the left side, uh, you have a, a tree structure where you can navigate the documentation, and in the main page, you have direct access to uh, the driver documentation. Uh, there's also a link to the corresponding PDF and we were quite surprised to, to discover that it was uh, more on, uh, than 900 pages long, and we have omitted the API documentation from it. <laughs> so there's quite a lot of documentation. Um, and also there's this convenient edit and GitHub link you can see on the uh, top right uh, of each page. So uh, if you notice some typo or, you know, easy things to, to fix. You can directly click on that and do the correction in a pure uh, web workflow and issue a pull request and yeah, you can upgrade easily the, the documentation. So to, to conclude, uh, I'll give you uh, some uh, preview of uh, GDAR 3.1. Uh, so in the development version, you can already find a new driver for uh, generated cloud-optimized GeoTIFF. Uh, so it's mostly uh, some syntactic sugar uh, to be able to, to create a cog with the right set of uh, GeoTIFF options. Uh, on the low level, uh, we made a few changes for to generate a more efficient layout uh, of the GOT files. And we made optimization on the reading side to, so, uh, to reduce the number of uh, HTTP GET requests. So I think it's now close to the optimum you can get with uh, using a, a compatible uh, GOT file. Another major work is the addition of a complete uh, new API uh, to be able to deal with uh, hierarchical and uh, multidimensional IRS. Uh, GDAL has been from the beginning uh, really a 2D uh, raster framework. And uh, when we want to deal with a uh, higher dimensional uh, IRS, we had to use this uh, sub data sets concept, which is kind of messy and non not dear, uh, necessary standard among drivers. So now we have a proper API to be uh, able to deal with uh, this multidimensional IRAs. So it's implemented for NetCDF, HDF4, HDF5, GRIB. Uh, I think the TileDB driver will also be upgraded to use it. And I think we, we can have more, more drivers uh, using this new API. And uh, the NetCDF driver on the vector side uh, has also been updated to be able to implement uh, the new uh, CF 1.8 simple geometries uh, convention, which is a way to, uh, to encode uh, vector features in a NetCDF file. And that's it.
right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all your all your work on this, uh, Evan. Uh, we do have time for some questions. Uh, Evan is actually Evan's quite responsive on the GDAL mailing list, but now's your chance to ask him something in person. <laughs> Uh, so, sorry, can you repeat the, the last part? Um, I don't think it will uh, really have difference on the uh, performance side. Uh, it's more on the on the capacities. Uh, well, actually. Uh, on the uh, coordinate uh, conversion uh, part, which is the main difference between GDAL2 uh, and GDAL3. Uh, setting up a new coordinate transformation can take a bit longer than before. Uh, that's actually the subject for my afternoon talk. Uh, because uh, now we use a, what is called a late binding approach. So when you want to transform between a, a coordinate system to another one, uh, we have to actually do lookup in the database to find the best uh, transformation path. Whereas before, uh, the transformation always uh, went uh, to WGS84, so it was hard coded and it was very fast. But of course, there were a lot of uh, cases where this didn't work. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's a question that yeah, <laughs> comes uh, over and over. Um, right, yeah, there are, uh, there's actually a, a project which is called Borch, uh, which is a CMake uh, approach to build GDAL. Uh, yeah, it's it's a side project. Uh, it's not uh, it's not an official one. Uh, well, we have already two build systems, and adding a third one <laughs> to the equation, you know, it's like this slide. We have 14 standards, and now we have 15 standards. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's an open question. Maybe at some point we. We we'll have a CMake uh, official build system, but uh, adding a third one uh, and given the size of uh, the GDAL code base, uh, uh, it's quite a difficult decision to take. <laughs> Uh, so your question was about how the fundraising went, is that it? Was it harder, do you think, that the fundraising, because it's so integral, do you, do, do you think that the fundraising was easier or more difficult than you had expected? Um, I didn't really had expectation because it, it was the first time we, we tried this, so in, in the end it went pretty well. Uh, I mean, I think... In, in one month, we, we gathered all the funds, so I think it was not that bad. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, we, I must really thank uh, Howard Butler because he, he really pushed <laughs> to the funders to, to make them uh, give the money. <laughs> um, that's an open question. <laughs> We, we must find first uh, big topics uh, like that which can attract, uh, uh, well, topics where a single funder cannot generally afford uh, um, funding the, the effort but where you need a, a bunch of, yeah, of people gathering together.
Well, uh, I'm clearly not a C sharp developer myself. Uh, so we have uh, Thomas uh, Seacrest, uh, which is uh, who is in charge of the bindings. So uh, yeah, from time to time he updates it. Uh, but yeah, if you if you have particular needs, uh, it's probably better to directly connect to him and and see if uh, if you can uh, update the binding or. Or bring yourself your your contribution to to the drive uh, to the to the binding of course.